What's up, guys? Welcome back to Muscle Minds with Dr. Scott Stevenson. I'm Scott McNally. Uh, all of our programming is brought to you by truenutrition.com. You can use our code ADVICES for, for some additional savings. Plus, that helps to support our programming. They've got awesome stuff, high quality, uh, things like citrulline malate, beta alanine, highly brain cyclic dextrin, your pre's, your intros, your posts. <laughs> <laughs> and they must be three different shakes. Three different shakes. You have to divide that out, yes. Yes. Because when it all goes into your stomach, there's three compartments, like a ruminant, you know, and, <laughs> like a cow, and like it's different, pre, pretty much, yeah. And the pre goes to the pre, as long as you, as long as you will it to go into that area. Yes. So that's kind of how it works. Nice. Yeah, the timing is absolutely vital for some of those things. What's going on, Scott? How you doing? <laughs> I'm good, man. I'm good. It's another. It's starting to. It's almost feeling like it's going to get warm here again in in Florida. Not that it's never not been warm. Yeah. But I've been riding the motorcycle. Ooh. Every, pretty much everywhere nice continuously which is great so so much fun i was going to the gym the other day and i was thinking i was gonna be a little late getting there yeah and i covered in like without like going extraordinarily fast i covered like what normally would have been about 18 minutes in five minutes no way. on the bike Nice. And it's because it's so i was hitting the lights so i so it's just fast enough to hit the lights uh-huh. so i caught the wave and then whatever lights I do hit, if I do hit them, I can accelerate from zero to 45 or 50 in like two and a half, three seconds if I so choose. Yeah. So I immediately leap forward like two blocks in front of anyone behind me. Okay, yeah. Um, and it's because these electrical motorcycles, and just like you know Tesla's electric vehicles, they're all so fast. There's, it's just crazy. The power is instantaneous. There's no gearing or anything like that to deal with. That's cool. Hey, so, I wanted to give yeah. a shout out to uh, one of our listeners, Christopher Wu. He is Uh a doctor of uh, general medicine in Malaysia, and uh, he also is uh, part owner of what looks to be a pretty badass gym. And he he listens and watches all he watches the shows on YouTube. Uh, He said Muscle Minds is his favorite, so I want to throw that out there. He's got a great physique, man. Doctor Wu. Yeah. Sorry. (laughs) But yeah, I just wanted to mention that. So, um, what do we have going on today? More like basics, like resistance training, training basics 101 stuff. Okay. That I've kind of been paying attention. Uh, I've been in this situation before. Long ago when I started graduate school, I was transitioning from, I was a physics and German undergraduate. So I took the, the prereqs to get into grad school and I started taking grad classes. And when I was at University of Texas, I took a, a class in the summer that was supposed to be like a pinnacle class for doctoral or master's degree students. It was a carbohydrate metabolism. It was actually taught by John Ivey, okay. who uh, did a nutrient timing book, really well-known guy, one of the best, most published guy in, guys in carbohydrate metabolism exercise, really well-known. And I took that class without the background that I really needed. <laughs> like I had some basic shit, and I, and I was just like, it was, I had to study 10 times as hard okay. to understand the concepts. And had I understood the background material, which I eventually sort of, I'm like, oh, that's where that fits. And this is what, what's going, and this is what they're referring to. It all, like everything kind of came crashing together. So I, I figured it might make sense for people who are like trying to follow the, is volume the driver of hypertrophy type of thing. And I heard a, it was actually on Fuad's podcast. They were talking about what intensity is. Mm-hmm. There's like a the title of the, the YouTube video is what is intensity. Mm-hmm. So I figured I'd just kind of cover that stuff. Then the intensity thing is like, it's been a, an issue, like a semantics problem, as long as I can remember, hmm. like, like what is intensity? Yeah. What does that mean? And people are li- literally talking about two different things when they use that word. Okay. So we can cover that. But okay. I wanted to cover like training, just like basic training principles. All right. I like this. That are, that are, yeah. It's like real kind of simple stuff, like nothing over the top, but then connect it with what you see in different programs, like my training system or John Meadows or DC training, um, and why those things make sense and why you would want to employ those to produce bigger muscles. All right. Get more jacked. Cool. I'm all for this, man. I think it's a great idea. I think it'll be good for people who have been doing it for a while, you know, like myself, Mm -hmm. maybe get some refreshers, possibly learn something new. Uh, And for people that are new, obviously, it could be of benefit. Because I will say the one critique I think we get of muscle mind sometimes is Scott loses me. 
You know, you you know, but it, it's good. <laughs> I have an encyclopedia. It's good to follow him with. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. It's good though. It's good to challenge people. Um, so where, where where do we start yeah. with this? I'm excited. I can I can send you the list of the training principles if you want, and you can post it up so people can see. That'd be great. Um, let me type this last one out so you have it all. All right. I'll just text it to you. Misspelled that. Did you out? All right, there we go. All right. So this is, and now that I, I didn't even realize this until just as we were talking, that when I was an undergraduate university, or when I was a graduate student at, at University of Texas at Austin, I got to be a, uh, a graduate assistant, a teaching assistant okay. for the weight training class that Jan and Terry Todd taught. And you know, of course, Jan through Victoria. Yeah. So they these were probably the best weight training classes that you'll ever see. Really? Um, but yeah, just because they were taught with a little bit of exercise science in play, I think, a lot of places. And I did this when I went and actually taught those same classes when I was in California. But you go into PE classes, and they just sort it's kind of like PE in elementary school. They just kind of let you roll around, I presume. <laughs> this is not to disparage any PE, PE teachers. Yeah. But the weight training classes, I think, can be pretty sort of like let people do whatever. And the students will tend to do that, too. They'll just like just a blow-off class to get some credit. Sure. So they won't, they won't want to train. Like, you know, they're just there not because they actually have some fitness goals. So anyway, these tr- principles of training were one of the things that we introduced in like a little 10-minute lecture. Okay. And this is like the basic of, basics of exercise programming. Of, this is like the ground substance of sports science huh. in large part. And it, it's what's going on. It's the paradigm from which so, sports scientists are viewing Many of the training related studies that they're doing is this is this is sort of the the perspective that we're looking at things through. So these are these principles of training. You could put them up now if you want to. It doesn't. All right, um, they're up. Just so people have. Yeah. So uh, specificity. Which where should we start? Start with spec. This is the first one on the list. So specificity of training. <clears throat> Basically, this just means that whatever you do. As, as a form of exercise, be it the mode, like if you're on a cyclergometer versus a treadmill versus a stepper, climbing uphill, running downhill, whatever the kind of or resistance training versus a, some sort of cardiovascular exercise, swimming versus cross-country skiing, the adaptations that you see will be specific hmm. to that mode of training. So a little bit of carryover. So remember the study we talked about two podcasts ago where they trained using squats and they tested strength on a leg press and a knee extension. Yes. And despite having a bigger quad, there was no knee extension strength yeah. increases or muscle. They just didn't know how to use it. That's specificity of training. So, and we applied that as to why you want to um, add in different exercises as well. So that connects with this variety um, notion, which is one of the other tr- principles of training. So that's just basically, if you want to get better at bench presses, you don't do a machine press. Yeah. It's not going to carry over very well. It's somewhat, but not very well. Um, individualization just means that everyone's different, which is totally true. We all know this. You know, this is why some people, some exercises just don't work for some people. Hmm. They get on a bench. Some people, squats just don't do shit for their legs. They get a big, big ass, and they just want to squat like a power lifter because that feels normal. Yeah. So that's a basic principle. So, Literally, when when people have those arguments and they talk about like you must squat for your legs, <clears throat> that's sort of in violation of one of these basic training principles that are, and that I couldn't even, I don't even know where these or, these originate because they're just sort of the accepted givens of exercise science in a certain way. It's like these are the these are the undeniable truths hmm. from which we start building our body of knowledge. That there is biological interindividuality, and some people are going to do well with squats, and some people aren't. Some people like leg presses, some people don't. Some people like a particular leg press, some people don't. So that's that is like so. If someone tries to constrain you to just do it my way or the highway, mm-hmm. 
and it's very, very clear to you that their way is not your way, then here's my, my way of saying like that's sort of in violation of one of the kind of the basic ideas that forms the foundation of, of sports science. And it's kind of common sense too. Hmm. You find the shit that works for you. Yeah. So that's the individuality or individualization. And then of course there's progress. Sometimes they divide this up into progression and overload. Mm-hmm. Um, so first and foremost, if you want to create an adaptation, there has to be some form of overload. So this goes back to general adaptation syndrome, which Hans Selye, have you ever heard that before? GAS? No. Have you ever talk about that before? So that comes from, uh, and some people suggest it's sort of been misapplied, but it's the idea that if you stress an animal in some way, mm-hmm. there'll be an accommodation, an adaptation that will occur to resist that stress in the future. Mm. And there are different phases of this. And if you if you go if you stress over stress, you'll actually have a lack of adaptation. Yeah. Sort of a decompensation. And that's what we would we would find if someone's literally starting to overtrain. So the idea is and you see this in all sorts of things. You, this is why I use examples like UV radiation on your skin creates a stress. The adaptation is melanin production so that you can have a darker skin that will prevent those UV, UV light from getting into your DNA and causing, causing damage yeah. genetically. So it happens uh, actually with radiation. Hmm. You can actually produce a hormetic response like with gamma rays that increases the uh, antioxidant capacity of cells. Hmm. Um, you see it with snake venom. Like this is, People will use small amounts of snake venom hmm. to pre- create an immunity to the snake, this is the snake venom. What's probably technically uh, an immunity or resistance, at least. So people who handle snakes do that shit. I think we saw it with so the Incredible Hulk. Yeah, that was a total, that's a little different thing. It was yeah. different gamma rays. I think he's got a little bit more than antioxidant capabilities <laughs> okay. that came from the gamma rays, but yeah. So, but damaging radiation will produce that in the if it's too much, then it's just damaging. Yeah. So there has to be some sort of an overload. Okay. Something that is outside the norm, normal realm. And this is the whole thing about resistance exercise that makes it such a great stimulus for growth is that just a normal set is way beyond what people normally do in the course of their day-to-day life. It's just sure. so outside the norm Absolutely. that it would produce this, what some people consider even kind of an aberrant adaptation, producing a callus that's made of muscle. So, and then progression or progressive overload, you kind of lump them together, means that you need to progressively increase the stimulus so that you maintain an overload. So that's just increasing the weight, getting more reps, maybe even getting the sets, getting the same number of reps with the same weights, but with shorter rest intervals, Mm. whatever it may be. So that's progressive overload. So you can see, like, if you sort of think of these, these are just pretty simple things, but they're all interwoven into good good programs. What's our next one? Variety. Mm -hmm. You do different exercises. So... There's, um, I think Fonseca is the name of the, of the article that, or the first author on the study that people often refer to where they, they compared training, I think chest with a squat or chest with a leg press, like one or maybe two exercises versus a variety of exercises over the course of time. And the variety of exercises produced significant growth in all the muscles of the quad. Hmm. Whereas just doing like one or two exercises, I can't remember the exact setup for the, for the particular study only produce hypertrophy in one or two. Hmm. It wasn't all four heads of the quadriceps. So variety, in our context, from a nervous system perspective, thinking back on what we talked about before, produces different activation patterns. You come in and do a new exercise you've never done, you haven't done before, have done a long while, and train chest as hard with just as many reps per set, and you'll be sore as crap. Yeah. If you haven't been doing, even like just bearing, if you're doing deadlifts, you go to a rack dead, or you go to a deficit dead, or you throw bands or chains on there, it'll change things. It's very, very similar, but it will change things. So the variety, and this is the interesting thing, and this is the way I really look at variety and overload. I don't see people talk about this very often, but variety means a change in stimulus, which is really what an overload is. Hmm. It's not that you're not lifting shit throughout the day. People are, you know, picking up their groceries and moving things around, picking up their dog or a baby or what have you. You still lift things. You still do those basic movements. You put things overhead in a shelf. You know, maybe maybe you 
push your lover off of you in bed or something like that. Most of the time we're not lying on our back pushing things up, but you're always doing those movements. Yeah. But you're just not but the variety in the case of adding doing those things in a resist in the gym with resistance exercise is an overload. Yeah. So the nature of overload is because it is it varies it's different than what your day to day stress is. Okay. So when people say the criticism, I don't get it so much, maybe because I've refuted it so many times, but every once in a while someone would like chime in on my, my Instagram and say, why do you do all these weird exercises? Yeah. And some of it's because I, 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 I feel those better. They're more, it's easier to have a mind muscle connection with those. I'm, as Dante says, getting funky with it, mm-hmm. but it's a different activation pattern that makes for a novel stimulus. Overload is a novel stimulus. A new exercise is a novel stimulus. They're basically two sides of the same coin that produce the stimulus, which is is an overload and evokes growth. Then, so variety is is super duper important in my opinion. Not that you want to give up and do all sorts of weird shit all the time and constantly employ the the weeder muscle confusion principle, but and people that's another kind of tangent we can go on. But people get up in arms by, you know, you can't confuse the muscle. And, and I'll address this too. I'm trying to think how people say it because it never makes total sense to me. But it, it's as if they say the muscle doesn't, what is it? How, how's people say, the muscle doesn't know the load or doesn't know how much weight it is or something like that? I've heard that, something along those lines. Yeah, that... it's, it's said in various ways. And it's a criticism um, of people using sticking to, sometimes it's used as a criticism of people sticking to the same exercises. And, Actually, um, we do have – there are, is a mechano, mechanotransduction signaling pathway in skeletal muscle. Mm-hmm. And when you have a different activation pattern because you're doing a different exercise, mm-hmm. if you look at one particular motor unit, so the nerve and all the fibers that it, that it activates, it's going to be activated in a different way. Yeah. So it's mechanical stimulus. The load that it undergoes – is going to be different yeah. with a different exercise. And the muscle does know that. And that Fonseca study actually is a demonstration of that in terms of actual muscle growth. Hmm. Um, they also have done, this is pretty cool stuff, They, you can do um, MRI to use a magnetic resonance imager to look at muscle activation. Hmm. So they've done studies where you do a particular exercise and they do sections so like along the length of a muscle and they'll look at how much how much activation you see at different points along the length of the muscle. Mm-hmm. And when they've done that for a given exercise and then expose those subjects to training, you see muscle growth that reflects the activation oh, in the training. Wow. So where there's more activation, like in the middle portions yeah. of the muscle, you see more growth, huh. which of course makes sense. Yeah. But literally it's been demonstrated. That's cool that you could see so, that. Yeah, it's like it's like that with the proofs in the pudding. They've actually demonstrated it's a proof of proof of principle type of demonstration that where you activate the muscle is where you're going to get the growth. Hmm. And you see that when you sometimes you can you can change your foot position or roll on the on the medial or the lateral side of your calf to activate the medial or the lateral heads, the gastroc more so, and you see muscle growth in the areas that are activated hmm. using those different exercise variations. So. The Charles Glass phenomenon of like filling in the holes and using all these funky exercises to create activation patterns um, that that are new and novel, and especially with the back musculature, which is so complex, mm-hmm. there, there's there's truth to that. Hmm. You can sense it, you can feel it. Like holy shit, that hit my back in a way it, I've never felt it before. Yeah, but it, there's absolutely truth. There's there's de- absolute truth to that. So at least. As, as absolute as we can have truth yeah. in uh, you know in, the, in this world. So um, the variety is super duper important, I think, as long as you're still applying those um, other principles, especially the progressive overload one. So just randomly, and like you were saying, I think you said a, a woman made a, a comment on your video that just go in the gym and be intense, mm-hmm. just train really hard. If you're sort of mindless, then – and you're, and you're not paying attention to what's going on in terms of progressively overloading, so getting better with more reps and or more weight, mm-hmm. then you'd be denying that progressive overload principle, and you'll you'll still get a stimulus, but it may not be an overload stimulus. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, and for most people, just training hard, you get the newbie gains, mm-hmm. 
any stimulus is an overload stimulus. You don't have to be, you'll just get stronger because you're adapting so rapidly. Sure. So, so variety can be overplayed, but, uh, it's super important. I think, especially for people trying to eke out extra amounts of hypertrophy that normally wouldn't come. I would say that's probably the biggest gap in my plan right now is variety. Since I, I train from home, I'm limiting the number of exercises I do each week or each workout. Um, my equipment is going to be more limited than if I were at, you know, the big corporate gym that has the entire hammer strength line, plus the entire right, free right. motion line and some Cybex machines over to the side. So I'd, I'd say that's probably my biggest limiting factor, but it sounds like you're telling me that you can create variation almost even within the same exercise. Absolutely. That's, I mean, that's what bands and chains yeah. both do. Yeah. And they do it differentially. Um, what happens, the bands tend to be, create a little more muscle soreness. They tend to be a little more taxing on the muscle. Do they? I didn't realize that. Than chains do. Really? Yeah. John Meadows has, has made this known. He says this. He, you'll, you'll see it. I think uh, he maybe even notes it in, when he writes his programs, but I've seen him talk about it. And I think we cover this in his, his book. I think I wrote about this in his book, The Brutality of Mountain Dog Training, because I have a section on bands and chains. But so imagine, let, let's say you're just doing a press, or it could be a squat, whatever, and um, you lift up, and as you lift up, um, the chains will add load the higher you go, mm-hmm. because more of the chain is being lifted off the ground. So and so that will happen. You'll you'll progressively overload toward the end towards the end of the not progressively overload is probably the wrong term, but you'll increasingly cr- increase the load yeah. as you go to the top of the movement. And then when you come down, there's going to be a free fall effect. So the chains, the chains aren't going to immediately be hitting mm. the ground. If you go really fast, they would just be totally free falling. Yeah. Just like you would with any free weight. Whereas the bands don't have that lag time. Mm. Okay. I gotcha. Yeah. And the thing that will differ with bands and chains is, and this is, this is going to be all over the place. So depending on the band where you get the band and the, the strength of the band so and the range of motion. So if you have a range of motion, let's say it's you know a, a chest press, so it's 18 inches, and you're using a really thick band, let's say, mm-hmm. you may see hardly any change in the force from start to finish in that band if it's under a lot of tension at the beginning. Hmm. So good bands have pretty equal tension. Once you load them up, enough where they're actually creating significant amount of increased load to the exercise uh, except for maybe like a hack squat where you've got a really long range of motion from top all the way deep into the hole a good band doesn't change the load too much i can see it that some yeah or it's stretched out so there's going to be a length tension relationship for the band and that's going to differ depending on how thick the band is hmm. and where you got the band whose band it is yeah so and how long the band is, of course, too. So if you put a little, really little band on there, mm-hmm. and you only got you know a total of five feet of material on with both ends of the band, that's different than if you have a band that's ten feet. Yeah. Because the relative change in length over the course of your absolute range of motion is going to be less for a longer band. Mm. So you literally would have if you took like two bands, let's say they're identical. Like I use the orange bands from Elite FTS. Yeah. They're just they're kind of good universal bands. They come in the mountain dog training pack. That's, I've got that too. Get there. Yeah. yeah, it's great. So if you took, let's say you're on a hack squat, and you can, you could take two of those orange bands and just load them just once. Hook it on the bottom, somewhere near the floor, wherever you can, on the frame or what have you. And then on the bar, two on each side is going to be different than taking one and looping it twice around onto it. Oh, yeah. Totally. Totally different feel in terms of the change in tension from top to bottom mm-hmm. and the amount of tension you're going to have too, probably, Absolutely. depending on how tall you are and how much stretch you have in the band at the beginning. So, but where with chains then, it's also going to depend on how you've loaded the chain and how heavy the chain is. Hmm. So at the top, you might have the chain completely um, airborne, so it's not resting on the ground at all. And you might have almost all of it on the floor. Yeah. So you could, and you can change that, for instance, by hanging a kettlebell off the end of the chain. Mm. So you got a twenty-pound chain, you've got a twenty-pound kettlebell. Yeah. 
and you got a lot of load at the top, and then when that kettlebell or, or whatever, you could have a couple of them. You, when that hits the ground, you immediately have, and you could you could figure out where to put that mm. so that it is just beyond your sticking point mm. on the way up. Okay, yeah. So you, you drive out of the hole, and you sort of position that in the right place, of course, along the range of motion, so that it provides extra overload where you're the strongest. Yeah, yeah. To change the groove. Yeah, you can do that. So, you can, yeah, you can. So, for, back to your gym and what you're wanting to do, you could, you can. You know, look kind of silly. silly. You know, like, like what's, what's this guy, guy trying, trying to do? do? But, but, but you, you would, would create a different exercise and they'll feel totally different. Yeah. Doing that. Um, I saw a, uh, actually it was in Jordan Peters' um, log on his site and he had done a hack squat really, really deep. Um, with a wedge, so he put at the bottom of the foot plate, he put a wedge in there that gave some some plantar flexion, mm -hmm. so it made it more of a quad based exercise. And he said it just literally destroyed him. His no quads kidding. were just totally wrecked. Yeah, and that was just a little bit of a wedge. So you get start getting wedges, put a wedge in there, put different configurations of bands and chains, and you could make three or four relatively or actually pretty different exercises with yeah. a hack squat if you wanted to. Yeah, so, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the bands and chains are great. And then there's all – I've got all sorts of tricks. Let me know and we can actually – I'd love to like – you can give me like the virtual tour of the gym and I'll, I'll try to come <laughs> up with some, some crazy – I've been – when I've been going, I'm training um, with Derek Oslin now. He's a 212 guy here in town. Yes, Weapon X. The, yeah, we mentioned a little bit. And yeah, and every he made me watching this now because we're gonna we're training together in a little while, and uh, like I think almost every day or like three out of four days I've been in there I'm bringing shit in yeah. like toys. Of course like, you are. Um, yeah, like I actually we're gonna do Mountain Dog Rows today, and I have a Mountain Dog Row attachment. Okay. That I bought from Elite FTS. It's just a little sleeve with a handle on it. That oh fits yeah. Over the end of a bar. Those are cool. But it's in my it's it's in the saddlebag of my motorcycle. Yeah. The, the pannier of my motorcycle. And we're gonna bring that in. So. That creates a whole different way to do. Um, you can do mountain dog rows on those actually with that with with the handle. So yeah, those, those are cool things. Like another like three or four hundred dollars worth of investment in like a um, uh, super squats belt or hip squat belt. Mm. From Iron Mind is the one I like the best. Candles like that. The, of course, the uh, the daisy chains with carabiners. Um, we were doing. Uh, you do overhead presses with dumbbells? I do. Yeah. Okay. Do you find like when you get up to the heavier weights, it's a pain in the ass to lift them up? Uh, you know what? I'm just getting strong again on them. I because I stopped. Yeah. I stopped right. pushing that exercise uh, after I tore my shoulder, and uh, now I'm, I'm. It used to be my strongest exercise, and now yeah. I'm very weak with it. Like I'll kick up the 75s, and I'll actually fail. You know, like I get to the point where like, it's not just usually if I kicked up the 75s, I go until it feels good and then I stop, you know, and I go heavier. Right. Now I'll actually fail on the 75. So I'm not yeah. that strong on shoulders at the moment, but they're, they're, they're coming yeah. back. We did a thing. The reason I so say is like, as you get, <laughs> yeah, the kick up could be the pain in the ass. Once you get like, when you get to hundreds, that's yes. the pain in the ass. Yeah, absolutely. And we just took, there was a machine that just, it just presented itself. Okay. It took those daisy chains connected in the top part of the frame, connected the other end of the daisy chains to the handles of the dumbbells. Oh, and nice. And they were just resting right here. Yeah. So you just, you literally, you just grab one, grab the other, lift, and when you're done, just let go. That's cool. I yeah. like that. Yeah. And for, like, for us, we were using different weights, so we didn't want to flip it around. We ended up just letting Derek use the hundreds. Okay. Um, but, like, for you, like, you'd, you'd, you know, go to kick it up probably with the lighter ones, and when you get to the heavier ones, yeah. you just set it up like that. Because... That I, I have this, I mean, that's the, that's the part that always, and I knock on wood that always kind of concerns me is that I'm going to like hurt myself with the kick up because mm, okay. it can be so fucking awkward, you know, like getting one up and then like trying to stay on the bench, almost yeah. falling on my ass a couple times doing that. Yeah. So there's so, a ton of little things you can do. You can, and I carry all these things in my bag, literally they're in my, um, it's in my book. One of my frequently asked questions is what's in your gym bag. Yes. I have all this shit in there. That allows me to like modify things, change the loading curve, add it, you know, make exercise safer, easier to do for a muscle round, what have you. That, I've seen the gym you know, big. Probably, yeah, I've yeah, seen the gym have. big. I've seen you pull a couple yeah. things out of there. 
bag of tricks, a little MacGyver bag. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, what's going on, guys? Thanks for watching another podcast here at Think Big Bodybuilding Media. And thank you to our great sponsor, TrueNutrition.com, for making this all possible. TrueNutrition.com is owned by Dante Trudell, the creator of DC Training. He wanted to create a supplement company that offered high-quality third-party tested supplements at a fair price. High-quality protein powders, just about every type you could think of. Huge variety of flavors, plus health and performance supplements. Check them out, TrueNutrition.com. And hey, if you use our code ADVICES, you directly support our podcasting. Thanks, guys. Let's get back to the program. And I actually have duct tape in my, uh, in my motorcycle, so I'm good to go, man. Yeah, you can do There's anything with that. I have now. Yeah. So, all right, let's see what else we got here. Uh, reversibility, that just means that you can detrain. Basically, it's if hmm. you stop the training, the adaptations will reverse. But interestingly enough, they don't – this is kind of – and this is a whole other topic um, – is that you don't – there's possibly a training effect on, for instance, satellite cell residence in muscle cells such that muscle memory – and, of course, there's an epigenetic effect that probably is in play here as well – so that the reversibility isn't complete. So you start training, you train for five years, you stop training – there's a possibility you have some some muscle memory that will mean you haven't really completely reversed back to your starting spot mm. because you've been previously trained. Yeah. So um, that's just basically, I mean, if you don't use it, you lose it. But people hold on to muscle mass better um, than they think, I think, many times. Mm. kind of depends on what you're doing. And you can, you can maintain muscle mass on a much reduced training volume as long as you, as long as you keep – the effort level high hmm. okay you're training you're training hard so there's that Let's see what else oh and periodization so that's sometimes people toss that in so that's what i do with with progressive blasts and intensive cruises that's what people get like all all up in arms with sometimes like macro and mesocycles cycles and all this crazy shit and people get lost in trying to periodize their training hmm. when they're kind of, I think in many cases getting the cart before the horse, hmm. because if you set yourself up on some sort of a linear periodization scheme where you have a planned, um, macro cycle, that's going to last eight weeks come hell or high water. And you're six weeks in six weeks into it and you're a broken down wreck and you don't pay attention and auto regulate and drop things back or move towards just, go to the end part of your macro cycle, which would be some sort of a deload, mm -hmm. then you're just not training smart. You're not training in tune with what your body's presenting to you. So periodization is super important. That's what, there's tons of ways to do that, but it is important hmm. um, because, hell, you can just, just from taking time off and coming back, you can get a lot better than what you once were, hmm. especially if you haven't done that before. And I've talked about that with with people that have done fortitude training they have a the intense cruise it's the first time they've ever done a deload probably yeah they come back afterwards and they're just like holy shit what happened here yeah you know they've never done that so so those are the basic like those are like the training principles upon all all this shit is built like really that's that's the, those are the ingredients that people are throwing into the the training program pie that they have mm -hmm. um i just wanted to like kind of throw that out as uh like we can even refer to this yeah. People will ask questions that are kind of answered, you know, in just understanding hmm. these basic. So the other, um, the other thing that I kind of alluded to it is that, uh, the notion of intensity is a semantic issue hmm. in the, uh, in the, in the, in the bro versus the bro science world or the, the bros versus the scientists. Okay. As people say intensity and like high intensity training. Right. And that for the average person and for most people who haven't had any exercise science, they just think that means training really hard. Mm -hmm. You have a mental intensity and that's one way to look at it in the exercise science world. That term is reserved specifically in the, in the context of resistance exercise for the, the load that you're using almost always as a percentage of your one rep max. Okay. So, if you're using 80% of your one rep max, that's more intense than 70% of your one rep max. I see. So if you see a study where they did like high reps, 
and it'll say low int- if they even put in the in the title low intensity versus high intensity resistance exercise mm-hmm. creates equal hypertrophic gains as long as sets are taken to momentary muscular failure. Hmm. All that means is they tested a low load versus a high load. Hmm. And they used 50% or 30% or some smaller percentage of the one rep max. Hmm. So in, and this is what John uses in his programs. And this is the term that, you know, people talk about in the context of effective reps is effort level or what your average person, lay person will think of as intensity can be quantified subjectively as RPE, a rating of perceived exertion, or a reps in reserve. How many reps did you leave in the tank? Yeah. So how hard was the set? And that's it. Hmm. So when someone says that was really intense, if you were like in like you know Data from Star Trek and Automaton, you say, well, no, it wasn't actually. That was you know that Widowmaker was not very intense because you used sixty five percent of your one rep max. Hmm. Okay, but it was a hell of a fucking set. Because the reps in reserve was nothing, and your RPE was a max of 10 on a 0 to 10 scale. Yeah. So effort level was off the chain. Yeah. But the intensity, if you're quantifying that from a programmatic standpoint, from an exercise scientist standpoint, what an Olympic weightlifter, weightlifting coach might, might say was not very high because it was a low percentage of, your ma- of the max load huh. you lift for that particular exercise. I didn't know that. It's yeah, and people don't because no one people don't bring it up, and I, and I've seen that like I remember when I was going through school, and I'm, I used to like cringe all the time when I would see people get confused with the intensity thing, and it's a weird thing people don't delineate those. It's so simple. I mean, it's not like rocket science to to see how the definitions differ. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like really a complicated thing, but it just doesn't get clarified. Hmm. So. You know, it's it's just sort of almost like a misunderstanding that is completely unnecessary, I think. Yeah. So so that's that's kind of an important so you can do a low intensity in terms of one percentage one rep max set that is a high maximal RPE, zero reps in reserve, you've taken a momentary muscular failure. So the exercise science definition of intensity would suggest that's a low intensity set because the load was low. Hmm. But Someone watching that set, let's say it's a Widowmaker, would never would never say you don't train intensely. Yeah. So, the high intensity training thing is interesting with Mike Mentzer in, in mind because he high intensity there is effort. Yeah. Um, and I don't think his, sometimes he would go pretty heavy on the loads. I don't know enough about HIT. I mean, it's definitely not light training. Right. You know, moving big loads. So it's high intensity in terms of percent one rep max, and it's high intensity in terms of effort level, Mm -hmm. both. So that is kind of confusing for people too, I think. He doesn't have people do, and you've looked at this more than I have probably as to what he specifically has said, but you don't typically go over sets of 20, I don't think, in HIT. You you know what? I, I don't know enough. To say, okay. but it, from what I understand, what I have seen, it didn't seem like it. Yeah, yeah. So, but intensity and in, like in the body, intensity means how hard do you train? Yeah. You train intensely. So, um, but in the exercise science world, that's just a term that's reserved just for the percent one rep max. Simple as that. It's just a mathematical hmm. thing. So, and the other thing that's interesting, I just thought I'd toss out is that volume, and this is this is one of the criticisms that's been just one of the pieces of the puzzle that's a little bit weird. Yeah. Um, and I'll kind of explain why is when they, they've done analyses showing that there's a dose response relationship between volume of training and muscle growth. It's pretty clear. There's something there. Obviously, you know, if you just do one set, you might get nothing as far as muscle growth. Mm-hmm. And if you do, you know, if you try to do 30 sets, you're probably gonna be doing too much. Right. And in between, there's going to be some incremental increase in muscle growth as you add more sets. So in order to, to do that cross-sectional analysis or a meta-analysis, you've got to codify all the studies that you have and so you can kind of equate them. So so-and-so hmm. does you know, bench presses. So another, another study does machine presses. Another study you know, rotates among three, incline and flat and decline. You know, so the exercise programs are all over the place. Hmm. Replication is like, it's not even something people think about. Most of them are doing just straight sets. Mm-hmm. So, but 
and mostly those sets are quote unquote taken to failure, which is a totally subjective thing. But what happens is that in order to sort of equate those, if they're looking at the number of, and they're going to measure, for instance, size of the triceps, mm -hmm. the studies will just say any exercise where the triceps is significantly involved, like any, any pressing exercise or an isolation exercise, so an overhead press, an incline press, a decline press, a chest press of any sort, counts as one set. Hmm. That, that's very often been the case in terms of counting sets. But we know that if five sets of bench press or five sets of an incline press are not the same as five sets of a, a rope tricep press down in right. terms of the stimulus that's applied to the triceps. So if you start equating those things, you immediately have a measurement error issue, basically, because hmm. hmm. you're not doing a, a – it's, it's the, kind of the only way to get around it to some degree unless you just count compound exercises as a half a set, which can be done too. Hmm. You still come up with the same answer. But that's one of the things that – is important to look at in studies where people, if people want to dig into that volume is the main driver of muscle growth idea, is if you're looking at, for instance, the triceps, and half the sets that are counted as tricep sets were not triceps uh, isolation exercises, mm. then you've got an issue, especially, especially if, as bodybuilders know, you're doing a chest press to train the chest. Yeah. And you're intentionally not training the triceps. So if you're if you're doing a, in my mind, if you're doing a good job as a bodybuilder, mm -hmm. and you've chosen a chest press to train the chest, then you have a good mind muscle connection, and you're intentionally not coming close to failure in terms of what the triceps can do. Yeah, the triceps aren't getting fatigued; they're not the weak link. You've taken them out of the exercise, and if that's the case, then you probably shouldn't be doing a chest press yeah. to train your chest. Because it's now a tricep exercise. So that's the thing that's sort of a, it's a contradiction in, ter in, in a certain sense. Because that level of, this is where the, the bros, the guys in the trenches, are kind of a step ahead of the exercise scientists. Because in order to, if you want to come up with a way to count the number of sets in terms of a, counting the volume, you'd ha you would ideally you wouldn't count those tricep sets. Or you, you'd count them as a half a set or something. But you'd consider the fact that if someone's doing a chest press, it's for the chest. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you count that as if someone does a really good job. So here's what could happen. Imagine the scenario. You've got one person who just they they're, they just train whatever they do. The chest press it looks the same, but it's just they're just a triceps and a delt presser. They don't get shit for growth in their chest. So all those chest presses are really strong. They're really strong stimuli for their triceps. Mm hmm. And the other person does six sets of chest press and six, uh, three sets of triceps. And they do a great job of creating a nice mind-muscle connection in the chest. And their triceps don't get anything from those six, six sets of chest press. Two each of incline, decline, and flat, something like that, let's say. So the one person does nine sets that are really pretty, pretty good sets for the triceps. And the other person does three and maybe the equivalent of like a couple extras because they do get some tricep work, but they do a great job of not using the triceps. Those are completely different stimuli. Oh, yeah. One's nine sets. The other one's four and a half sets or something like that. Yeah. Half the volume. But on paper, if you count them all as triceps, that's nine sets mm -hmm. either way. And, and you're actually – so what you find then is the person who's doing a good job of making the chest press into a chest targeting exercise is not going to get good growth – as good a growth in their triceps – if those three sets of triceps are suboptimal in terms of volume for producing growth in the triceps, because they're only doing three sets. Yeah. And you can't compare the nine sets with the person who just drives with their arms on everything with the guy who's doing So the better bodybuilder might end up having, is, gonna, is basically undergoing a completely different s stimulus in terms of the triceps if that's where you measure the muscle growth. Okay. And that's an easy place to do it because it's on the arm. So... That's something to consider that's kind of, Im kind of important um, when just looking at training volume is that in those studies, they just look at the number of sets. Hmm. And how, many, how often, let me just ask you this, how often do you do cluster sets or drop sets or rest or forced reps, those sorts of things in your training? Um, I'd say semi-frequently. 
semi frequently. <laughs> like every other wor- workout, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd say so. It, it's not, right. and it's not going to be for everything, you know. So maybe, maybe let's say I were training legs and it were hamstring focused. I may do, you know, hamstring curls might end up being some type of a intensified set for like a top set, right. you know. Right. So that's the other thing that that's that isn't doesn't get included that people very very often do in these in the scientific studies is they typically just do straight sets for the sake of simplicity. Yeah. Because yeah. how the heck do you when you do a rest pause set and you get twelve, th- four and three reps, so you get nineteen reps. Mm-hmm. How the hell do you equate that to someone who did ten reps and nine reps in two straight sets? Yeah. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> I mean, a you got it's it's a it's a totally different animal. It's it, you're, so you're only you're only comparing straight sets in the, most of these studies, whereas most people are doing some sort of cluster set or drop sets. Mm. And there's various studies that have investigated those. So the mind muscle connection, in terms of how people are ex- performing the exercises, compound versus isolation, mm-hmm. is a source of fuzziness in terms of set counting. Mm. And then in terms of external validity, we've got the issue that people don't just do straight sets. Some, many people do, but many people are doing all those sorts of intensifiers intentionally mm-hmm. because there's a stronger stimulus that comes from that. Mm-hmm. So how do you know, like, you know, let's say you, you do 10 sets that are straight sets and two of, two of the things you do are cluster sets. Okay. And so those 10 sets kind of get you to you're building up the accumulated stimulus of a workout. And what really is that makes that particular workout an overload was the fact that you went beyond failure in some way, shape or form doing those cluster sets or those drop sets. So 12 sets, straight sets wouldn't have done anything. It's only those cluster sets. Hmm. It's only the drop sets that made the difference. Yeah, That's the driver in the in, with a sort of a cake of those 10 straight sets it's the icing that made the take cake taste so good and made it a stimulus that produced muscle growth hmm. so though that's a thing that's kind of hard uh hard to think about because how do you count those like two cluster sets like two rest pause dc rest pause sets i don't know that's that's probably worth at least three sets but the reps are going to be half as much or less than half yeah in terms of total reps well, what about the effective reps? And how many effective reps do we count? Is it just the last five? You know, are all the all the reps effective on the second and third failure point of a rest pause set? I would say so. So you do a rest pause set that's 12, 4, and 3. Do you then get, like, two effective reps on the first and then 4 and 3? So that's nine effective reps. So how many sets do you have to do to get nine effective reps if you do straight sets? Hmm. So that's a little bit, it's confusing, but it's worth considering because the effort level and what creates the overload stimulus is really what we want to quantify by looking at training volume. And it's an over, it's a known, it's not like the exercise scientists who do this work don't know this, but it's a known oversimplification. Hmm. It's a known um, potential for uh, lack of precision in quantifying training volume because you're just doing straight sets like that. And that's kind of the only, only way to get around it. And that's why like when everyone jumped on uh, Brad Schoenfeld's study with uh, showing that you have really high levels of training volume produce greater muscle growth. Mm -hmm. He was literally, he wasn't saying anyone should go out and train that way necessarily. Um, But literally just was showing a proof of, of concept. So that's what the exercise science is, is, is just trying to show that there's there is a relationship between volume and muscle growth to some degree and but it can't really unless you start comparing rest pause sets on top of straight sets and all the complexities and the way like John does training mm-hmm. I mean or the way the way you do fortitude training like I've never seen any there are a few out there but there's there's no study that's looked at fortitude training where people are doing straight sets in the six to twelve range hmm a, a, a fortitude training style muscle round and then high rep pump sets that are auto-regulated. We know that auto-regulation helps um, in terms of, of terms of progress. Mm-hmm. We know that cluster sets can be advantageous. 
We know that heavy training gets the job done. So you've got all these combination of things that all the individual studies have shown there's some effectiveness there. They, but they don't get tested all in one in one particular study because you don't know what's creating the overall effect. You compare like a straight set program versus fortitude training program. Is it the muscle rounds that made, let's say that fortitude training is better just for the sake of argument. Is it the muscle rounds that did it? Is it the fact that they could auto-regulate the training stimulus and how they do pump sets? Yeah. You know, what's, what's the deciding factor? It's not isolated. So to some degree, unless you just have, unless you can just commandeer, you know, thousands of people and force them to, uh, to do just resistance training study again, 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 over and over, you're never going to be able to tease apart all of those particular aspects because we're, we're, we're testing humans here. Mm -hmm. But the individual pieces can be teased apart and say, ah, that's a good ingredient. Cluster sets are a good ingredient. Autoregulation is a good ingredient. Higher rep sets taken to failure, that's a good ingredient. And But testing them all at once doesn't allow you to tell what actually worked. But the other studies, just they just point in the direction of those are the good ingredients. Volume that's high enough to produce an overload, that's a good ingredient. you got to do enough. So the studies can, can't be taken literally, so to speak, to use sort of the lay terminology, um, because what is actually done is so different from what's done in the studies when you combine all those sorts of things that they're just not, they're just not the same. But that doesn't mean the studies are worthless. Yeah. So anyway, that's the, the training volume thing, which is a little bit of a, it's been a point of contention in the, the sciencey, nerdy bodybuilding world about like, what does that really mean? And the intensity thing is just worth, we're saying, cause you hadn't even heard that. Yeah, no, I hadn't. And I see, I see, I see arguments all the time and people don't know what they're, they'll literally say, no, this is what intensity is. And it's like, no, this is what it is. And they just argue without trying to clarify, well, there's two different ways it's, it's used. There's two meanings to the word. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. So we did have a question too. That, we had a question yes, from Dallas. Yes. Um, okay. Oh, the one from uh, earlier in the week. Yes. Or last week. He said, yeah. uh, he, and I know you answered him over at the, the board, at the group, I should say, uh, for Think Big and, and Advices Radio. Um, but I wanted to ask you here, because I thought this was a, do you mind if we uh, dove into that one for a minute? Yeah. All right, cool. Because I thought, yeah, people would get a kick out of it here. He says, um, I'll start by saying I've been listening to the podcast for several months now and love the information that's being put out. I stumbled upon Advices Radio after reading Scott Stevenson's Be Your Own Bodybuilding book, bodybuilding coach book. Uh, however, I've never asked a question. Uh, let's see. He's got one for next week. Let's, okay. Here's a question. My question is for Scott McNally and Scott Stevenson to discuss potentially using widow makers as a tool to train your CNS. I have a gym partner, um, who to me looks like he half asses his sets but he says he hits failure. His bar speed barely changes, and then he racks it. After listening to last week's episode, I thought about utilizing Widowmakers to train his CNS to push him further into his sets. Any thoughts would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. And thanks for watching, Dallas. I'm yeah, listening. that's a good question, too. It's a great question. So actually, I can I can address that a little differently than I did when I answered on the on the on the Facebook page with uh, the notion of specificity of training. So if we're going to train the CNS to get better at those grinder reps, where bar speed slows down, where you really look like he's he's pushing, you're pushing very very hard. You have to have practice at that. You have to actually do those reps often enough mm. to then expose the nervous system to that level of effort so that it can get better at it and you can learn how to do it. Yeah. So you can imagine someone who, like let's say they, they finally get motivated to do like a really hard rep where otherwise they would have racked. And this time they get to that point and they just hold their breath, they do a Valsalva and they close their eyes and, they just, and they're squatting, let's say, and they just push up and they literally almost fall on their ass mm -hmm. because they've never tried that hard before. So the next time they come back, the next workout when they're doing the Widowmaker or another set like that, this time they realize I should probably keep my eyes open. <laughs> you know, maybe a little bit of breathing at the bottom. You know, bust off at the bottom, but 
excel on the way up and they they figure out a better strategy yeah and and then they realize you know that maybe they rack it after one really tough rep like that and they always you know i probably could have done another one like that so the next week they come in and this is what i think dallas was kind of getting at is that over time calling those sets widow makers where you can rest as long as you want mm -hmm. and then expose yourself to those those grinder reps where you rest five seconds don't put the bar down sets on a squat and you get practice at doing that, you would get you get better at it. Mm -hmm. You get used to there'll be a, a like a true CNS motor learning effect, mm -hmm. just learning how to execute the skill of staying upright while you're pushing that hard, not closing your eyes, what you're doing with your breathing, knowing like you need to keep your back arched so you don't let your back bow, which a lot of people do on those last reps when they get low back fatigue. So all those things would come into place. You'd have internal mental cues that'll be involved and just learning how to activate and disinhibit during those high effort sets mm -hmm. high effort reps at the end of a set is something that would come with practice then there's the psychological effect of knowing that you're not going to die you know that you're going to make it through um some people can get kind of a claustrophobic feeling too when they're when you're breathing that hard yeah and you think like you know i just have to get out of this like let me free like let me out from the bar, like they're kind of a panicky type of thing. Yeah, and you get used to that. You realize you're yeah, not you going to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can and you can just and then like you can eat, like I that's one of the things when I visualize and this is a psychological phenomenon is I will visualize <clears throat> the feeling that I have where the vision you know di distance really isn't a, a factor in my vision. It's sort of everything's kind of blurry. You can feel how it how it hurts where it hurts, um, what, the, what your motivation is to drive the weight, all those aspects of like that really like the most uncomfortable part of the set, you just see it in your mind's eye. Yeah. So you get used to it. So, so yeah, you, it, by, by just calling those straight sets, widow makers so that his training partner would like for, have to practice the hard grinding reps like that, um, is a way to get that practice in. But first and foremost, and this is what I did say, on the board. So it's a matter of having the practice. So the specificity of training would take effect and you get better at those. But if he's not motivated to do that in the first place, mm. so he says, this is my failure. And like that rep is just the same speed and looks just as effortful as the first rep. And that for him is failure. Then he's never going to get the practice. Yeah. He's never going to be able to learn how to do those. Cause he's never going to be driven psychologically to push himself to that level. So if the motivation isn't there, um, it's not going to happen. And I, I mentioned uh, the funny story I think I've told here before. I've told it a few times. So um, when I was in back in Arizona, I, was, I had my gym. And uh, I'd been doing – this was before Fortitude training. And I'd been doing D.C. training. And I was doing some other things. And I decided I'm going to come back to D.C. training. Mm -hmm. And the main trainer, like the first trainer at my gym, is the first guy that we had. He's there the entire time. Andrew was his name. Great guy. Uh, he wanted to train with me because he's like, now I want to put on size. He's either like, I want to put on size, and then he's like, now I'm too fat. And he's always didn't know really what he wanted. He couldn't set down a goal and track after it. So he was always jumping from one thing to another. Yeah. But he figured like if he came on with me, like I was going to train at a time when the gym was empty, when he wouldn't have clients normally, we could train together. Three times a week, DC training, two-way split, no problem. He can do that. Mm -hmm. So we start off, we train lower body the first day. And uh, we decided we're going to do Smith squats was the exercise for that day. And I do my heavy set. He does his heavy set. And then it's time for the Widowmaker. Okay. So, you know, and I explained to him, like, how a Widowmaker, you know, goes, why it's called a Widowmaker. Yeah. That if someone, if you were married, you know, someone's thinking you're probably going to kill yourself and you're going to make a widow out of your wife. Yeah, because you're gonna die at the end of the set. Like this is it. Like this is your last breath. Yeah, yeah. And I do my widowmaker, and uh, you know I get done. I kind of climb out from under the bar, and I'm you know panting and breathing and everything like that. And he's he's sitting there on the bench in front of in front of the the Smith machine, and um, so I kind of look up and I look over to him, and he's not really looking at me, and I'm like, uh, it's like, what do you want, my man? Like, what do you want on the bar? Like, how much weight? And he's like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, what? He's like, I'm not gonna do that. I don't want to do those. I don't want. I'm not doing that. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, okay, no problem. 
Yeah. So that not. was it. Like that was the end of the workout. He's like, I'm not doing this. Yeah. Because I don't want to train that hard. <laughs> just didn't want to do it. You can't blame and him. That was it, which was great <laughs> because that did, then I didn't have someone lollygagging, you know, and sandbagging all the way. You and know, faking for it. Weeks yeah. on end, making excuses for not showing up or who knows what. So, but he just wasn't going to do a Widowmaker. He just wasn't. He, he knew, like, because he, he would see how I do them, and he knew that what he would do would, would I hate to say it this way because it sounds egotistical, it would pale in comparison. Yeah, it wouldn't yeah. be the same. No, because he, you know, he wouldn't, have, be, he wouldn't put the heart maker. into it, yeah. Yeah, he just, just, just didn't want to do that, you know? Yeah. So, and he just admitted it, like, he doesn't want to train that way. So he would never get good at those because he would never do them. Right. He didn't want to. And, he didn't want to do them. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, you know, the thing it's, it's kind of tough. The thing that like, I'm just thinking of a solution for Dallas's training partner. Hmm. Um, and you don't, you don't doing this on all exercises is not convenient or practical, but one thing you can do if you want to get a little extra stimulus and train personal trainers do this a good bit. And it's a way to sort of trick people into getting extra reps and even getting used to pushing past a failure point is to basically get, do forced reps. Okay. But add those reps in before they really reach failure. Oh, really? So, yeah. So you're stronger on an eccentric than you are on a concentric. Yeah. So you can lower more weight than you can lift. And, I mean, you could literally, if, you, if someone completely pulled the weight up, you can go to failure, and most people can do two or three reps, yeah. depending on the exercise. And, um, with Of controlled negatives only, with no... No, no effort whatsoever. Literally, the bar just comes up, and then you do it just a controlled negative. So, let's say someone's doing a weight that could do like twelve times, and the thirteenth rep they'd hit failure. Mm -hmm. What a person trainers will do is you get to like ten or eleven, and they start helping. Mm. So, what that means is then they get fifteen reps, let's say, and you assisted on the concentric, so you made it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. They never really reached true because. Failure is almost always a concentric failure. Yeah. Unless someone just, every once in a while, like if they, maybe they rest at the top, you know, and then they then they try to get another rep and it's just like way too much and they just kind of give out. They have a kind of a nervous system collapse. Yeah. But it's almost always failure like at the bottom because they can't concentrically move the weight or they're somewhere in mid rep. So you avoid the concentric failure, but you give a little bit of assistance so they get you know one or two reps shy of failure concentrically. But you've added then three or four reps that are eccentric, mm. the lowering, which they can do because you're stronger that way. And the energetic, um, the, the metabolic stress or the, the metabolic uh, demand of eccentrics is much less than concentrics. Okay. It doesn't take much at all to the weight. You can do that repeatedly again and again and again. Yeah, yeah. So that would be one way to get a little. And what that would do then for his training partner, if he's trying to get him to learn to kind of stay in that zone mm -hmm. is you get 10 and you give a little of assistance. It's not a failure rep yet, but you give a little bit of assistance and then you just give incrementally more and more assistance. So he spent, so he has five reps that are short of true failure hmm. that are within his training effort level, like what he's willing to do. Yeah. So instead of having one of those where he's like at his max effort that he's willing to give, he has five because yeah. you're assisting him. Plus you're, adding those eccentrics, which is going to create more stimulus. It's going to create more, more muscle uh, soreness as well. But it also will, because of the repeat, repeated bout effect, prep him for training hard in the future so he won't get really sore. Yeah. So that thing you can do is just give a little help. Yeah, um, I like that too. Along the way. Yeah. So that's a, that's a way that that's, – that's one, one like real practical reason why having a training partner or a personal trainer there – can kind of supplant your lack of motivation mm. in a way. Yeah. If you really don't like the failure reps or they're not safe to do, you know, you could add on basically forced reps, um, but not really like you ever, you ever had someone like you asked, like, I want to do a forced rep. I haven't done this for a long time, but it's happened to me many times. And so you ask for a forced rep, just give me a little help. Mm -hmm. And they just want to fucking kill you. <laughs> so literally you're like here and there, it's like, we don't want to make it a 10 second rep. Just, keep the bar moving at a normal speed, but help me out. Yeah. And they just like, they're just like, it's like, okay, now the bar's going back down. You need to help me more. Right. Have you had people see you before? Oh yeah, of course. 
what are you doing? Trying to kill me. So you don't want that in this situation because that's yeah. going to – that actually would create a lack of – that That doesn't create a lack – that creates a lack of, of, di- of trust yeah. with the person. It's like, are they really watching out for me? <laughs> yeah, anymore I don't ever do – I don't really do any kind of spotting. Like I don't ask for help. I just don't. You know, it's not – either. And I want people to stay away. I see their hands coming toward it, you know, and I, I would rather just do it myself. And because I, I usually train myself anyway, you know what I mean. And I can take it there as far as I need to. And if you know, I don't know. Right. I had a a guy. This is a long time ago, and I was doing an overhead press, barbell overhead press, in a overhead press bench. And uh, I was warming up, and I think I was I was pretty strong at the time. I was. I mean, I was going like two and a quarter or something like that. Yeah. And so I did 135. I think I did 185. And I'm literally just kind of repping out. And I see in the mirror in front of me, I see him run, run up. And he's like, just like, he gets up on the platform. He wants to spot me. And I'm just, I'm bringing the, and I'm, I, this is still a warm up set. So I'm, okay. I'm not really strong. It's on wanting to grab the bar. Yeah. And. He, uh, I was like, I was like, no, no, I got it. This is a warm up set. And he keeps on putting his hand near the bar, and he's it's getting like he's really close to the bar. And I'm like, please move your hands from the bar. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, basically, I think I said, would you go away? <laughs> like, literally, get out of here, Graham. <laughs> and then I went to two and a quarter, and the guy, he couldn't get out of his head. It, like, so it was a nice intention. He ran over, and he when he went to jump up on the platform, he tripped and he fell into the bar and knocked it into my head. Oh shit! Almost fucked me up. Bad, yeah, oh and I'm like, that's why I didn't want you to help me. So please <laughs> let me do this by myself if you would. But it was like, yeah. So you don't know when someone comes out of nowhere what what they're gonna do or where they're at or if they're give you too much help or yeah, they don't know what to do. So yeah, you got that happen on them. a dumbbell press, incline dumbbell press. Yeah, someone tripped running up on me when I was going to failure, and I had I don't know the 120 something over 100 pounds, big big dumbbell my hand and they hit my elbow and the dumbbell went like that and fell onto my head. Oh my God. Cause they tripped when they were running up. I've had a lot of people run into you in the gym. Well, this is, this is like twice in 40 years. So okay. it's not that often, but you know, <laughs> cause I've been at it for a while, you know? Yeah. 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 Those are the only two times I think that's ever happened. Uh, I think. I remember well, I wasn't good at spotting Shelby when he needed, he didn't mm-hmm. really want spots very often, but there was occasionally a time that he would want some type of assistance just er, like early on. I remember I wasn't good at it because I was, I I had really looked up to him a lot. And so I was like really nervous. Like I wasn't going to do a good job at it. And so I was not, I remember that's the, that's the one time I can think of where like, I was not a good spotter at that point. Yeah. I think the way like kind of a mindset to have as a spotter is you want to make sure the person's safe, but you actually want to make it harder yeah for them yeah that's the whole point is that you can take the set further than you would without a spotter because you have the safety net of the spotter in place sure sure so so when you're watching them and they're struggling um you know you don't like just pull the bar up right away you're not there to like make it easier there to make it harder and let them struggle so you almost want to be kind of have a little bit of a taskmaster's mentality like sure i'm gonna i'm gonna we're gonna wreck you in this set i'm gonna make sure you get wrecked yeah i'm gonna make sure you're safe while we get you wrecked yeah and then that that works out most of the time so there was a a time this was um this was a long while ago but there was a went down to nogales mexico oh to wow. a power lift okay there's some people that there was a friend of mine had some friends who were competing in this meet and they had a guest lifter there. And I forget the guy's name. Um, he, at the time, was in the running for the world's – he was a, one of the best bench pressers in the world. He, he bench pressed over 700 pounds. He was going for a meet, going for like 720, I think, mm-hmm. in an upcoming meet. And so we went to this gym, and he was there. And there's 20 powerlifters in this meet, and everyone's so intimidated by him. Mm-hmm. Cause he's just fucking gigantic guy and he's really well known. I wish I could remember his name, but he was sort of in the running for a while. And I just walked up to him and just said, uh, I just introduced myself and started, you know, talking with him. Cause what I noticed was he was like trying to put his suit on and he was, he was managing chalk and all this, and no one was helping him out. And there's a little bit of a language barrier there too. Yeah. This was in Mexico. 
And uh, so I ended up just chatting with him. All the powerlifters were like scared of him or they were intimidated by him. And like, I didn't know. And I just wanted to learn from him. So I ended up helping him get his, his bench shirt on. And I actually ended up spotting him okay. for his for his attempts. And I remember this because um, I'm like, it's one of the first and only times when they had spotters on the side. Yeah. But his first attempt was 675. Wow. And it wasn't a great bench for spotting. And I'm like, if something happens, I can't pull this weight off him. Mm -hmm. There's no way I can, from that angle, pull 675. He's fucked. Yeah. So I don't know what I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to be as, you know, uh, quick on the draw as I possibly can. Yeah. And I remember it was a hot day. There's no air conditioning and it's summertime in Arizona, actually in Mexico. So even further south. Yeah. And I was sweating, you know, and trying not to sweat on him while he was getting ready. <laughs> right, right. And uh, he said, but he said, watch me close. And I remember he brought the bar down. And he did a, a full pause, and he exploded with the bar so fast, I literally almost reflexively could not pull my hands out of the way. Oh, shit. Keep running in the bar. I literally almost hit the bar with my hand. Yeah, yeah. So the 675 came up. It was like like literally like that. It was like, holy shit. That was like a half a second for the whole round. Wow, record. wow. It was amazing. And God, then he strong. went to 7 or 705, which is part of, this is like part of his training. Yeah. Because this is one of his, his, he planned this for one of his heavy days, I think. Okay. Before it come, leading into the meet. So um, then I was a little bit more in tune of like how the bar speed's going to be yeah. with the 705. But I was, I remember that because you reminded me, it was like, I was like, I don't want to fuck this up. You know, I don't want to, no. I don't want to ruin his rep. No. Throw him out of his groove, especially with those. It was just a like a single ply bench shirt. Uh -huh. It wasn't raw. But in the single plies at that time, this was close. He was going for the world record. Wow. But you still – you throw someone out of the groove on a bench press like that. Those guys are so – has to be so precise. You could fuck him up. Like, could, that could be it. So – Yeah. But he trusted me, you know. He's like, he's like, hey, can you spot me? I was kind of the only choice because no one else was talking to him. Yeah. And uh, he looked at me. He's like, well, you look like you lifted for a little while. So <laughs> right. I got to spot him. Literally, no, I've never done a powerlifting meet, and I don't even bench press. Hmm. But – Anyway, yeah, that was that was kind of cool though to spotted someone pressing seven hundred pounds. Yeah, no kidding. Just to be Great. there, be that close, and see it like that, you know. Yeah, you just know, like it's like when you get really big weights on the bar that's heavier than I've only pulled that weight on a deadlift before. I've never like squatted that like on a machine. I have that many plates, but yeah. I've never had a. I'd never probably then. I think I actually had, but just seeing all that weight on a barbell and the bend in the barbell and just knowing yeah. what's there. Yeah, it's like wow. It's fucking go time. I was amped up. I was I like, bet. you know, was totally psyched just to see this happen. So anyway, yeah, spotting it's good. Spotting is a, uh, is an art form. Yeah. Yeah. It you really get is. To know your partner and, yeah. And how much to push them and how they fail. So anyway, we got any more questions that popped up on the, uh, nope, none, none there yeah. today. Yeah. That's about all we had. Yeah. And we're about an hour over an hour in. So this is probably a good place okay. to, to wrap it up. I know you got to get out to the gym and uh get your workout yeah. in so yeah you know train right on in that case uh guys you know as as uh dallas had mentioned check out uh byobbcoach.com for uh doc for scott's book uh be your own bodybuilding coach and uh, of course go to fortitude training.net check out the training plan there and uh, we have a patreon now i started a patreon scott for yeah. think big and your voices radio so you guys can check that out. I'll put that down in the show notes if anybody's interested in supporting what we're doing. Uh, and, of course, go to our sponsor, truenutrition.com. Use our code advices. Scott, as always, it is a pleasure, my friend. My pleasure, man. Have Thanks a great workout. I will. Later, brother.